Welcome to Decision Analyst Insider Series Webinar on Market Segmentation and Profiling. My name is Christy Allen. I am the Marketing Director at Decision Analyst and the moderator today. Before I introduce our presenters, I have a few notes for everyone. In the handout section, there is a copy of today's presentation along with some relevant papers. Also, please feel free to ask any questions by typing in the chat box. We will attempt to answer as many questions as we can at the end of the presentation. If we don't answer your question during the webinar, someone will respond to your question within a day or two. Today's presenters are Clay Detloff, Senior Vice President of Insights and Innovation. Clay is an expert in qualitative research and has 25 years of experience. And Elizabeth Horn, Senior Vice President of Market Analytics. She specializes in market segmentation in both the business to consumer and business to business realms. And with that, I will hand the presentation over to Beth. Thank you, Christy, and welcome everyone to our webinar today on consumer market segmentation and profiling. Together today, we will paint a portrait of success and give you the keys to do that. So over uh, many years of conducting uh, segmentation research, we have developed a five-stage approach or phase approach to conducting uh, market segmentation for success. And during our time today, we will discuss these five phases in detail. So the first phase will be the exploration of consumers' attitudes, needs, and behaviors. This is a qualitative research-oriented phase. The next phase, phase two, is the actual segmentation research. And this is the part of the process that is most familiar to many of us who conduct segmentation. Uh, we say this is where the magic happens. Um, the segments are actually formed in this quantitative phase. Phase three we call a deep dive. And this is the opportunity to go back and uh, more fully flesh out in a quantitative manner the segments. Phase four uncovers motivations and really gets in very deep in using qualitative and ethnographic methods to create personas or consumer portraits. And the final phase, perhaps the most uh, missed phase in research, but perhaps the most important, is the activation workshop. And here is where the segmentation is actually integrated into corporate culture. And with that, I'm going to hand off the presentation to our resident qualitative and insights expert, Clay. Thanks, Beth. And just to kind of add a little bit to what Beth said, I, um, as, as head of the qualitative group, I actually prefer to think that some of the magic happens in phase one also, not just in phase two. Um, you know, segmentation is really about connecting better with your target audiences on your, or your customers. You want to know what's the best way to approach them, and then what's the best way to motivate them. As I was preparing for the webinar, it really struck me how similar raising kids is to segmenting the market. You know, if you have multiple kids, you have to try to kind of motivate them. You have to entice them in different ways. And, you know, as much as I would like to, as much as I try to kind of have an equal footing for all of my kids, they all respond differently and they're all motivated differently. And, and I think that's a lot of the way we need to think about segmentation. Um, it's that same kind of approach of how to reach each one of those um, individual segments. For successful segmentation, you need to have as much information about your target audiences as you possibly can. You know, with your kids, you live with them and you get to know them. With your customers, you have to find out about them through research. The key in this phase of qualitative is really to cast as wide a net as possible to ensure that you understand all there is to understand um, about your customers and to carry that knowledge into the segmentation development in the quantitative phases. As segmentation has evolved, many types of segmentations have been developed. You have segments by product or service needs, by price, by geographic area, you know, demographics or psychographics. Regardless of the type of segmentation you end up with, though, you limit yourself if you go into a segmentation project thinking, this is the type of segmentation that we want to do. You know, and that's where this exploratory, this first phase is so valuable, because it lets you get the insights 
that are needed to input into the segmentation in order to make it the most relevant and actionable that it can be. To maximize the results you get from the qualitative work, a lot boils down to you having an understanding of your audience's behaviors, their perceptions, and their motivations. You know, by going into the quantitative with an understanding of these three areas, you're going to really be able to identify those characteristics that will most differentiate and motivate the segments. You know, just as a side note, you know, when we start to look at this exploratory research, you know, it's also a good time as for an assessment period. It's at this time that a thorough and realistic assessment of what is known and what's not known about the target audiences is taken. You know, you want to see what previous set, previous segmentations have done, you know, where they lack and where they're strong. You know, a lot of companies come into this phase with a detailed knowledge of their customers and potential customers, while others don't have very much knowledge at all or lesser knowledge. Sometimes even because of advances in the category or just changes in the world in general, you know, what they do know may be outdated. So after this assessment, you know, the exploratory work can really be tailored to complement and supplement your existing knowledge. You know, you don't want to have too narrow a focus. Again, cast as big as net as possible for the um, best results from your segmentation in this phase. Because segmentations are so involved and so important to the future marketing efforts of your organizations, we often use a combination of in-depth methodologies as well as real-time methodologies to get the most thorough understanding we can. You know, we found it's important to have both points of view, really to help develop that successful segmentation and to gain a better market picture. You know, as far as specific methodologies go, you want to tailor the methodologies to best meet your goals and needs. Um, in essence, though, each piece of the research that you do should help you to peel that onion of understanding a little bit better. You know, and again, you may already have existing knowledge or understanding in certain areas that would lead to a heavier or maybe a lesser emphasis on a, a particular methodology or area that you need to understand. In addition to this kind of in-depth and in-the-moment perspective, we also really want to make sure that we capture both the rational and the emotional insights from our respondents. You know, I love this quote from Dale Carnegie, which states, um, when dealing with people, remember, you're not dealing with creatures of logic, but creatures of emotion. You know, when you look at all three of these areas, behaviors, motivations, and perceptions, there are a couple of keys you really need to pay attention to. First, it's kind of important to understand the decision making in the context of consumers' actual usage or the way they interact with the products or services. You know, decision making doesn't happen in a vacuum. We want to know what's the context that usage and purchase happen in. You know, it could be a stage in life. It could be a specific moment in time. In addition to that, we also want to make sure that we understand the, the equities, the strengths, and the disequities or the weaknesses of the product or service. Putting these two in, to, per, into together really helps you to kind of understand exactly what's going on with your target audience. You know, I'll give you an example. Um, we're based here in Dallas, Texas. And um, personally, I'm a, I'm a big Dr. Pepper drinker. Um, if you ask me why I like Dr. Pepper, just offhand, I'm probably going to tell you that, you know what, I like the taste of it, which I do. But if you ask me when I'm most likely to drink a Dr. Pepper, then is, some, is when you can really get some key learnings. Because for the most part, I drink most of my Dr. Pepper in the morning. You know, it's my, my energy boost. It's kind of my time to wake up and, and help me get my work day done and, and get started in the morning. It, it, it's my coffee replacement, if you will. So by understanding that context and occasion, you get away from just kind of more of the general perceptions, but you really kind of get into the, the nuts and bolts and the actual relevance of their products and services. Now I'm going to turn the time back over to Beth. Thank you, Clay. Moving on to phase two, we take those rich learnings from phase one and we use those to create a solid survey instrument. So in this phase, we're, we're going to conduct the actual segmentation research. It is quantitatively oriented. And just as a refresher, what do we mean by a segmentation? So a segmentation, the overarching goals are to develop distinct consumer groups, 
so that we can market to them effectively and also for new product development. So what are some segmentation criteria? How do we decide uh, between or among several solutions? Well, at Decision Analyst, we have three main uh, uh, stages that must be reached. Uh, the first one is that the segment members have to share more similarities with one another than they do with members of other segments. The second is that segments need to be large enough for client companies to mount uh, cost-effective advertising campaigns. So we want to reject segmentation solutions that have a lot of little itty-bitty segments. Uh, the third one is segments need to be reachable. Um, attitudinal segmentation is all well and good, but we have to have something that helps us for our media buys and media planning. So we'll run through some uh, basic consumer segmentation schemes. Um, we have a more rich discussion of uh, quantitative segmentation in another one of our webinars. And if you're interested in that, uh, please let our moderator know and we'll get that to you. So some of the basic segmentation schemes include uh, segmenting by demographics. And these are observable characteristics such as age, ethnicity, it could be um, gender identified with, uh, even perhaps where you live. Um, and of course, as segmentation moved on, we, we became a little more sophisticated and looked at characteristic segmentation. And this is based on a unidimensional aspect of a consumer, such as a disease state. Uh, for example, uh, looking at all people who have type 2 diabetes. It, the industry moved then into psychographic and attitudinal segmentation. This provided a, a richer layer, and this was based on more attitudes, feelings about product categories, and then lifestyle choices. We also had price segmentation, and this was intuitively appealing because we know that there are consumers who are more sensitive to price and consumers who are less sensitive to increases in price. So automatically companies would create product lines that would be of the good, better, best variety to appeal to different segments according to price. So the industry and schools of thought moved into uh, better segmentation schemes. Uh, we now have needs-based segmentation, um, it sounds exactly like uh, what it is. It looks at the core problems that consumers are trying to solve. Uh, things like uh, being able to uh, aspirational types of things or being able to uh, take care of your family or work effectively, some core needs like that. Um, another type of segmentation is location-based segmentation. This gets a lot of attention, especially among our companies uh, who use direct mail. So if we can figure out where our segment members live, and we know that birds of a feather flock together, we can target particular geographies with particular mail pieces. We also have transaction or usage-based segmentation. Many companies have um, these wonderful loyalty databases that have rich transaction and perhaps other usage or visitation information. These can be used to form segments and then, of course, um, email marketing if possible. We also have multidimensional segmentation. We have uh, a rich white paper on our website about this particular segmentation, including a case study example, if you're interested, and we can direct that you to that. But this is where we look at multiple aspects of a consumer. Um, attitudes and lifestyle can compose one segmentation. Um, another segmentation could be um, media consumption patterns or brand perceptions. You take these two or three or four different segmentations, cross them, and you form uh, these larger groups uh, or larger segments. And the learnings can be uh, 
well, more robust in this case. We also have uh, demand segmentation, and this has gotten a lot of press recently. There are some companies that call it demand space segmentation. And this considers different types of needs within different types of usage occasions. And in particular, this type of segmentation acknowledges the fact that humans are complex creatures. So the same person can have multiple needs at multiple times of the day, and they can use multiple products and services to fulfill those needs. So large multinational corporations are using this to help uh, map their product portfolio into what consumers actually need. Segmentation modeling, there are a lot of sexy techniques out there and they have fun sounding names like k-means and latent class clustering and choice modeling. At, at decision analysts, we're fairly agnostic about techniques. All segmentation techniques have a little bit something different to offer. The key in this case is to use multiple techniques on a data set and view the segmentation output, again, using our three criteria of evaluating good segmentation schemes. Some popular uh, segmentation techniques include cluster analysis. Um, more recently, uh, researchers have been using choice modeling, so actually having or consumers make choices among products and attributes and pricing on several screens and using a modeling approach for that, that, is, that yields very rich segments because those are based on actual you know, simulated purchase behavior. So once we have all this wonderful information, uh, we need to answer some basic questions about our segments. Uh, the questions are, who are they? How do we describe them? Uh, what drives their purchase or usage behavior? What are the best ways to talk with them, message to them? And what is the value to your business for each of the segments? So understanding who are they, we have collected a rich quantitative set of information from our segmentation survey. We can use segment profiling looking at uh, the demographics, the attitudes, the uh, behaviors that we've assessed in that survey and putting them into um, a really nice visual display. Uh, we, here we call them the one-pagers, uh, a one-page summary or infographic for each segment that is really easily digestible um, and can be passed along in the organization. But this is an initial picture, um, almost a line rendering, if you will, of the segment. Then it's important to understand uh, their purchase or usage behavior. So you can use a variety of techniques here. Uh, we use key driver analysis, quad mapping, taking a look at what's really important for your brand within a particular segment and where your brand might be falling short or where it might be particularly strong. And then we need to understand how to talk to our segments. And certainly in our quantitative survey, we can ask about media consumption habits. And if you're fortunate enough to have access to uh, particular databases of um, third-party nature, uh, some of these can be appended to your segmentation solution, and then media consumption can be um, uh, more fully fleshed out in this case. And the final question that we want to answer about our uh, segments is what's the value? And here we're not attempting to forecast how uh, well your product is going to do in each segment. What we're really trying to understand is based on the segment size, um, based on purchase behavior, and even based on attitudinal match with your company's portfolio, what is the relative potential of each segment? 
And you can do this in a variety of ways. We produce something called a segment potential index. And uh, segments that have higher indices are better targets for the company than are segments that have lower indices. And once you've conducted phase two and you understand and have built your segments, it's now time to turn to uh, going a little deeper into all of your segments or perhaps just a few of your segments. You know, the old expression, the hindsight is 2020, uh, applies to segmentation research as well. Um, all of us arrive at the end of a project and we've answered many, many questions, but we've also generated many additional ones. And I think that's the hallmark of really solid research. So this phase is the opportunity to delve deeper into key issues um, among one or it could even be all of your segments. So this portion of the research program is designed as a quantitative survey. Likely it won't involve as many consumers as phase two. Uh, in fact, many of our clients use this phase to conduct research into uh, specific subcategories of consumers. Um, for example, uh, they want to understand how the product's heaviest or most loyal users fall along the segments. And this adds uh, to the organization's ability to target and market to the segments. And now I'm going to turn over the presentation to Clay. Thanks, Beth. You know, once the segments are identified, it's really time to kind of bring them to life, if you will. Um, this is an especially important part of segmentation, really, because it helps organizations put a face on and internalize the different customer groups that have come out in the segmentation work. For successful persona development and portraits, you really have to understand what the segments are that came out of the quant. And this is critical, and right now Beth and I are kind of having trade-offs between the quant and the qual, but I think one of the key things is that you're looking at the whole segmentation process. And, and as we work internally, we're kind of working side by side, hand in hand, if you will, to make sure that we're understanding what's the what's a the initial handoff from the qualitative learnings to the quantitative. And then this follow-up for the quantitative kind of due to the persona development. Because it's key for us to understand as we develop the personas, you know, what went into these um, segments. Um, who the people are, the, the type of segmentation approach that was used in order to really help to bring those to life. Part of the role of the persona development is really to kind of better understand and, and to tell the story. That's really a lot of what it is. Um, you know, without the personas, there's often confusion around why is one segment different from the other? You know, or uh, is there an overlap here? Or what is that overlap? So these personas really can help to kind of uh, concretize, if you will, in people's minds and in the organization what these differences are. You know, personas really help to ensure that the segments are accurately portrayed by showing these differentiating characteristics. So it's not just kind of wanting to say, here's who these people are, but the persona really needs to show why one segment is different from another segment. And I think that's a key part of that persona development. You know, where the exploratory phase of, of qual was really open-ended and, and exploratory. Again, the purpose of this phase is really to help tell that story, to kind of identify those differentiating characteristics, those motivations that each of these segments have. You know, some of the things that we need to tell are who the person is, what they do, what they like, you know, what motivates them. As far as methodologies in this section, we'll often use in-depth interviews, we'll use focus groups, we'll use oftentimes ethnographic type of research, whether it's what we call a virtual ethnography, um, which is possible now because of, you know, the advent of cell phones and uh, flip cameras and things like that, or we'll do a more traditional in-person um, ethnography. But the, we choose the, the methodologies, we choose the occasions and the context that will again really kind of help to tell this story 
and, and to bring these different segments to life. You know, at the end of the day, there's a lot of different ways to bring these things to life. Um, you know, there's a lot of different charts and goal charts and series of charts, if you will. Um, Beth kind of mentioned the idea of the one pager, which we use and, and I'm sure a lot of other people use also. Um, but the really the goal needs to be is to help the organization use the segmentation results. And you know, each organization has a different culture and, and a different way of looking at things. And so part of our goal as we work with our clients is to make sure that these, the way we present these works are the best able to reach your goals. You know, sometimes we have clients that, or organizations that are more visual. Sometimes they're more verbal. Um, sometimes it's important to kind of broadcast out and make sure everyone knows the, the details. Sometimes it's important to know kind of just a high end approach or an overarching look at it. One of the things that we've kind of shown here on this chart is, is just an example, um, but it's some kind of a, a, an example that you can see we're talking about Alex. You know, you're able to see the different aspects of his life as well as his interaction with the brand. You know, some of the information we learn about Alex, he's a good student, he's popular, and he's considered a trendsetter. You know, from a product usage standpoint, he likes to learn how to wear something new and how to try it, and he's big into observing. Whereas another segment, it may be they're not all into observing and, it, you know, it's more of the action. So the, the segmentation varieties, it's important to really break those out so that you understand what those differences are and how people react to uh, different circumstances. What I want to do now is, is one of the methods that we have found to be very helpful in understanding segments is the usage of video montages. And um, we really think that these really help to bring a, a segment to life, if you will. And they typically run anywhere from two to five minutes. Um, you know, and sometimes we um, work with our clients that want to have one segment per video, if you will. Sometimes seg clients like to have all the segments on one video, so they have everything there together. But the key is we're wanting to bring these segments to life and identify the characteristics that distinguish those segments from each other. Um, the video we're going to about to show is um, what we're calling the time-stressed mom segment. You know, the example we're going to show shows one mom, um, but it, we often bring in several different clips of different people. Um, who all characterize that particular segment or segments. One of the ways that we found very successful in bringing the segments to life is in our use of video montages. These montages can help to spread an understanding of what a segment is in a format that is easily digestible. Each montage can either be one segment or can be a compilation of all the segments of interest. We've put together a brief snippet of what one of these montages could be like. In this video, we are looking at the time-stressed mom segment. Again, this is just a brief overview of what one of these montages could be. Here, you can see we are looking at one of the critical occasions for that segment, which is in the morning period. You can see some of the key characteristics and criteria associated with the segment. And you'll be able to see a short clip from a woman in that segment to help bring it to life. Um. Sometimes it's hectic, sometimes it's organized. We do have a general schedule of when I wake up, I'll wake up first, I'll wake up my daughter, um, and then we'll feed the cats. And depending on what's going on in the house, I don't have a scheduled time of when I do laundry where I put aside and do that. So sometimes um, moving laundry around from the washer to the dryer, from the dryer to a, um, laundry basket. I don't fold anything right away. I just kind of put it aside to be folded later. But that can take up time. And then while I go and get ready, my daughter decides to go make her lunch. So while she's making her lunch, um, I'm getting ready. But she's 10. And so what I have to do to prepare is make sure I have the selections and options available for her in portion size packages so that she had she knows she has to have a um, a vegetable and, and some fruit and a dairy product and a protein so we have to have that all um, available for her to 
choose from. Um, and then she's supposed to get herself ready. And then my husband will wake up and he'll get himself ready. And I know there's only three of us and, and we do try and keep it on a schedule, but a lot of times it can get kind of hectic during the day, during the morning to get ready. All right, so as you can see from that example, it's a great way to kind of really help bring those segments to life, um, to give a face and a name to segments to really help you understand. Um, you know, a lot of times we find our clients, um, after we um, do a video, we'll just kind of internally be referring to that profile or that segment, at, you know, as the Alex's. And, and as we talk with them, you know, over the years, they'll be kind of going back and always referring to Alex's or being able to, um, in, in, in a back room of a focus group, for example, saying, oh, these really are that segment. And it really just helps to kind of bring to life and to concretize in people's minds what these segments are. The next thing we want to talk about is really something that we think is, is important in an activation work um, in segmentation, and that's an activation workshop. You know, and activation workshops are really all about helping companies utilize segmentation results. There's a lot of time and effort that goes into a segmentation, and the thing we don't want to have is these segmentations, you know, just kind of put on a shelf, if you will, for lack of a better word. You know, again, we found these segmentation workshops really helpful. You know, when developing a workshop session, planning and collaboration is really key, and, and you have to approach workshops as partnership efforts. It's important that as you work together, you know, you have clear goals and session outputs, um, as well as a clear understanding of who session participants will be. One of the things that we really strive to understand in these workshops before going in in the setup is who all the players are going to be in the workshops. You know, it's important to know reporting structures, for example. Uh, it's important to know the strengths and weaknesses of, of the individuals that are going to participate. Um, because we want to make sure that we get the best and the most that we can out of every particular respondent and participant in these sessions. You know, generally speaking, these um, sessions should involve those stakeholders who will be impacted by or have an impact on the success of the company's sales and segment initiate initiatives. You know, sometimes it's going to include outside agencies as well. Many of the techniques used in our work sessions are really kind of designed to spark both that individual and group creativity. As I mentioned, there's a lot of different people in who have a lot of strengths and, and look at things a lot of different ways. Sessions are going to typically feature, you know, open and unaided questions, um, as well as use of aided and projective techniques. You know, the, given the, all the ways in which people think and feel, we believe it's really important to attack the issues from multiple ways to gather all of the input from all of those participants. You know, in order to do this, we really kind of have a toolkit of ideation and brainstorming techniques that we use. Um, and we've kind of picked the ones that are most applicable to each of the sessions. Some of the activities that we've done in these segmentation workshops include um, things like coming up with print and TV spots or reviewing spots with an eye to each segment. Again, the goal is not necessarily to, you know, come up with a finished product, but it's more of the training, the thinking behind it, the um, getting people acclimated to thinking and understanding the different segments that we're going to be talking about. You know, other activities we've done in these um, activation workshops include uh, developing in-store promotions, um, customer service tips, you know, and other things um, that a segment um, must understand or have. And we, the beauty of this is it helps people to really kind of understand the differences by segment. So if you look at a, um, an advertising spot, for example, if you look at it with an eye from each segment's standpoint, it really gives you an idea of what those motivating factors are, as well as how to better motivate each one of them.
just kind of in conclusion, you know, at its core, one of the primary goals of a business is basically to get people to use or purchase more of your products or services. And solid segmentations are really a proven way of making that goal happen. Some of the ways to use segmentation results, you know, are shown in the chart you see, can help guide positioning and marketing strategy planning, um, identify key drivers that underlie the long-term success help employees better understand the different types of customers that are out there and how to interact with those different segments. You know, as an organization, we need to cultivate and really develop buying and users behaviors. Sometimes we need to strengthen or increase what they're doing. Sometimes we need to alter or change behaviors. And sometimes you need to make uh, smaller steps and just educate or provide information to the consumer. You know, regardless of the behavior you want, motivation in some form or another is needed. In essence, we really just need to entice or encourage customers and potential customers to do the things that we want them to do. Again, kind of going back to my, my children's example, just as we try to entice and encourage our children to do the things that are good for them or that we want them to do. And this is really where the power of segmentation comes to bear. You know, as we identify the right motivating factors within each of these segments, ultimately we really can begin to understand and influence the consumer and not just monitor and see where they are going. And I appreciate your, your listening at this point. I'm going to turn the time back over to Beth for any questions. Yes, and resulted. we have several questions sent in um, by our attendees and we'll just go through them and Clay and I will, will uh, answer them. Uh, the first one is if a company is in a time crunch, can any of these phases you suggested be omitted? And what are the risks of omitting whatever phase? So Yeah, I, I think, you know, and, and I think this gets back to a lot of that assessment period to understand what you know and what you don't know. Mm -hmm. um, we've had some clients that are, they feel that they have done all the upfront qualitative, for example, right. that they need and they would go straight into a, a quantitative segmentation. Um, but it, it's important that assessment period, that assessment time is really important to understand what you need and what you don't need. Right, and it, I think that's a great point. Um, another phase that uh, our clients can be tempted to omit would be that deep dive phase after the quantitative research. Um, it, I think this is very useful, especially if you have a well-defined heavy user or um, loyal user segment. You want to make sure that your heavy users are uh, in some sort of way uh, allocated across the segments. The percentages are going to be different by definition, but I think it's important to do the deep dive. Uh, some of our clients are, are tempted, of course, to omit that phase. Um, some clients even will um, omit the, the persona development phase and just end right after the segmentation research. Of course, that is up to uh, the particular client involved, and we certainly um, understand everybody's in a time crunch. Uh, the risks, which is the second part of that question, is that the company will miss something, something key, something crucial. And, uh, you know, certainly I would never recommend omitting an activation workshop. <laughs> yeah, uh, people ask me all the time, you know, I have this segmentation, but we never use it. And, and if I, I, I ask, well, have you ever um, had any sort of workshop or uh, some sort of discussion on how to apply the segments? Well, no. Okay, well, uh, that, that phase is very important. I, I would agree with you there. I, I think most of the time when we've found that the segmentation has been put up on a shelf somewhere, there wasn't a workshop done or, or because it does take some upfront time mm -hmm. and some uh, resources. But I think it, it's invaluable as, if you're, as you're trying to make sure that this is incorporated throughout your organization. Okay, and, and toward that end, we actually have uh, questions about the activation workshop itself. Okay. Um, uh, let's see, one of them is, who exactly do you recommend participate in one of these activation workshops? Um, good question. And, and really, that kind of is dependent, I think, on the company that is involved and the, the type of company, that uh, business that you're in. 
um, and, and I don't have what that business is, but you know, overall, I would say that you need to make sure that you have the members of the in insights and marketing research team. Um, marketing and sales should be in there. It's important, I think, also that you have operations, and, and this could be from a corporate standpoint, and again, depending on the organization that you're involved in, I think it's really helpful in one of these activation workshops to include people who, if you will, are a little closer to the customer, who have some maybe feet on the ground, boots on the ground, if you will. Uh, you know, maybe it's an area or a regional manager. Um, for some organizations, maybe it's one of your larger franchisees. Just those who will be able to kind of give you the, a closer view of what's actually going out, uh, going on in the field. Um, advertising agencies and PR firms, great um, participants to have in these sessions. They bring their own insights as well as it helps them to understand where you are going from a corporate standpoint. Um, and uh, of course, the appropriate brand or product team members are all going to be um, important to have in it. You know, overall, I'd say it's important to get a good mix of senior leadership that can really help manage that and champion the message, if you will, make sure it is carried out through the organization, as well as those who are more of the practitioners or more of those who are going to have to be um, implementing those um, segmentation uh, uh, stimuli and, and the communications. Okay, great. We have another question about the activation workshop. And this one asks, can you do an activation workshop uh, if you already have an existing segmentation? I, definitely. Um, I, I would say that, you know, if you have an existing segmentation and these activation workshops are, are great. And as Beth mentioned, it, they're one of the more important parts, I think, of a segmentation study. Um, and so you can take the existing segmentation work that you have done, and really it's about bringing that to life um, and, and internalizing it within the session. So definitely could do one if, if, if you have an existing segmentation. Um, I, I encourage those activation workshops it, it, uh, regardless. And you know, that brings up another point is if you have an existing segmentation, but you haven't done or gone through the persona development phase, the qualitative ethnographic phase, it sounds like it's possible to go back and do that as well. Yeah, you can. It's, it's uh, you know, it's not a problem to go back and do kind of a the, that persona development later on. And um, sometimes we've had those persona developments done after the activation workshop even. Mm -hmm. You know, I, th I think the only thing that you have to worry about is how long a period of time it goes. You know, if, if you're in an industry that is changing rapidly, um, you know, segmentations last for a while. Yes, but do. Um, you don't want to kind of five, six, seven years later say, oh, let's do a persona. Let's do that at yeah. that point, right. Yeah. And in fact, that dovetails into another question we received, which is how often should a segmentation be updated? Um, and when you update one, uh, do you use the same segments or do you start all over? Um, how does that apply? And the answer is, of course, it depends, which is really no answer at all. Uh, so I'll qualify that. Uh, it depends on the industry. So if you are in uh, working in high tech uh, industry that evolves very, very quickly, you might consider a two year cycle on your segmentation. Uh, we have uh, consumer packaged goods uh, companies or fast moving consumer goods for our friends who are in Europe uh, who do these segmentations every three years. Um, very rarely do uh, we recommend waiting five years. There are some durable goods manufacturers in uh, industries that don't change, change much. That could be okay every five years, but more and more the pace of business gets faster and faster, and our segmentation work, which is really the framework, the lens through which we conduct business, needs to be fairly current. And should we update the segments or, or look at the current step? We always recommend uh, ensuring that we can actually profile new segments against the existing segmentation because you want to show the migration. We think that's really key, especially for buy-in when you go to your activation workshop stage. And, and I was just about to jump in. I think that's actually one of the, the best mm -hmm. uses of an activation workshop is if you're in an organization that has been utilizing segmentation or segments over the period of a few years and then a new segmentation came in that there are some differences and changes. 
one of the best uses of an activation workshop is actually to help in incorporate and integrate throughout the co company what those changes are because everybody's question becomes oh well how is this different from what was there before and in that case you can tailor these activation workshops to really maybe the whole goal of that activation workshop is to tell people and instruct people what the differences are why we're going to this new segmentation you know and the ways it's better or just different okay uh still some more questions we have a lot of interest from our audience i can you do an activation workshop? Uh, oh, we already got that one. For video segments, do you use real people or scripted actors? I like that question. <laughs> we use real people. Yeah. Um, and, and one of the things that we like to do is, is you know, we, using real people, we have to make sure that we are, um, you, you know, get their buy-in or, or their approval to use their um, their video, if you will, in, in um, work. Um, you know, one of the things that we tell them is that it's not going to be commercialized. They're not going to see themselves on YouTube. This is for really in, in, um, internal purposes. But yeah, I believe it's really critical to kind of make sure that we have that personal touch, that you really know who your customers are. Um, and so uh, we will um, use uh, real people, just making sure that they have given us approval to use them. Yeah, and, and I know that Clay's team filters through a lot of hours of video to to get those really good, well um, uh, articulated uh, segments and 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 uh, segments of videos. So yeah, it, it's kind of one of the things that kind of along the lines of big data. Now you have so much capability with video. Now you almost have so much that you have to sift through and you know a big chunk of time is spent just figuring out how to manage that video um, and, and to pick the right pieces. Um, video is, is very um, intensive as far as, as taking up file space and so how to manage it, how to move it around and so forth. So that's actually been one of the bigger challenges in our industry of just what to do with um, videos and how to manage them. Exactly. So uh, the f last question that we can actually get to during our time is, uh, what advice do you have for uncovering a consumer's deeper emo uh, emotions about a product or brand? Yeah, I think um, it's really important when you want to understand their, their motivations, if you will, that you look into understanding, again, we talked a little bit about that rational and emotional um, aspects. We use several different methodologies um, when we are trying to kind of understand the, the relevance. Um, we use um, uh, laddering is one of the, the key pieces that we use. Uh, we use imagery. Um, we use um, what we call the um, customer journey, um, which entails, it's kind of a typical point in time timeline, if you will, but we couple that with different emotions that happen at each point in time so that when someone's washing machine goes out, how do they feel? Um, when they are looking through um, Google for information on their, um, you know, to replace, make a replacement or a purchase, are, are they overwhelmed? What feelings are, are, are they, is there confusion or is there clarity and light at the end of the tunnel? Um, so we use several different methodologies, um, but it's really, again, I think one of the key things is to understand the context that they're using it in to really understand their perceptions, the positive and negatives of the different brands, the different categories, the players that are out there, their behaviors, and their motivations. All right. Well, terrific. Thank you so much for all those uh, questions. And now we'll hand the presentation back over to Christy. All right. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for attending today's Insider Series webinar. And thank you, Beth and Clay, for a wonderful presentation. If you have any more questions for Beth or Clay, please feel free to email them. And our next Insider Series webinar will be Wednesday, May 10th. Decision analysts Stan Hazen and Felicia Rogers will be presenting product testing in the real world with in-home usage tests. We hope you enjoy today's session and are looking forward to seeing you for next month's webinar. And have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you.